for today's message? I don't believe you. <laughs> Are you sure? Well, I'm so pleased that you're here for the second part of our series on um, reason to believe. We started with this verse, and I've asked you to memorize it. Anybody made progress on it so far? I didn't think so. So we're going to start again. This is week two. And so uh, put it on a three by five card, uh, put it in your car, whatever it is. But let's say it together. Maybe if we say it five Sundays in a row, <laughs> we'll, we'll at least get the gist of it. Say it with me. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. So uh, I'm going to begin today's message with this question. Anyone attend a wedding lately? Okay, you attended a wedding lately, anticipating a spring or a summer wedding? I am. I have two weddings. I have one this weekend and one in, in April. So uh, anybody helping to plan a wedding? Okay, <laughs> good luck. <laughs> I've, always, I've always like watched the mother of the bride. I call it the MOTB because they are so invested in that wedding process. And then the dad, you just have to have a checkbook and walk 40 feet. I mean, that's, that's basically what, what a dad does. But uh, Jesus and a few of his followers, this is the beginning of his ministry. He only has a handful of followers so far. We saw last week how he recruited Nathaniel and Philip and, and uh, Andrew and Peter and John, and so just a few of, of his disciples so far. He hasn't recruited everyone. And he and his mother and his friends, they're invited to a wedding in Canaan. Remember last week we discovered that this is where Nathaniel is from. He's from a small, small little village. And if you have your copy of God's Word or you want to open up your device or if you don't have either one of those, there's a Bible for you underneath the chair in front of you. I'd ask you to turn to John chapter 2. John chapter 2. And this is what it says. On the third day, a wedding took place in Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, they have no more wine. I don't think she whispered that to him. I think there was a little bit of panic in her voice. And the reason why is because in a village like Cana, a wedding, first of all, it lasted seven days, the, the celebration. The, the reception part lasted seven days. That's why they ran out of wine. It lasted seven days. It was the most notable thing in the entire community. It was a big, big deal. Now today, when we go to an event or whatever, we, we have a lot of drink uh, options. You go to a restaurant, you have a full menu. And so then... And at the time of this wedding, there was basically two options, wine and water. And they, they really hadn't figured out the germ science thing yet. So, but they did, they did figure it out that if you drank too much water, you would get sick. They, they made that, that connection. So what they did is they would take for the water, they would pretty much uh, take one part wine and two parts water, dilute it down, and then that would be considered something that would not make you sick, right? But th at this place, you had, you had that mix, but then you had also the wine, and it was, it was gone. It, it was just gone. Spoil alert, Jesus changes the water into wine. I don't know if you, if you don't know that. If you're new to the Bible, Jesus actually changes the water into wine. I, so I, I, I have a, a ministry acquaintance. We're not, we're not friends, but I heard this story. He told this story. He's a runner, and he and his buddies, they decided they were going to go on a run. And so they placed water bottles every once in a while on this marathon, the, you know, just water stations. Well... Their neighbor, 
of his friend, the neighbor of his friend, saw that they had put water bottles in the um, mailbox by this guy's house. So when they took off and they were running their marathon, they get to their marathon, they open up the mailbox and the neighbor put Blue Moon beer in, in the place of the mailbox. <laughs> and so the one guy who was running was once in a while coming to the church, you know, this pastor friend of mine. And so, and so he was like, looked at it, looked at the pastor, looked at the bottle of beer, said, now, pastor, if you could do that every time, I might believe. <laughs> I don't know if blue moon beer is good for you on a run, but that, that, was, that was a comical thing. And so this is kind of what you see is like, all oh, there's a surprise. It's like, the wine is gone, and here we are at this wedding. It's a very um, festive thing. And Mary comes to Jesus and says, the wine, it's, it's empty, it's gone. So I just want to stop here for a moment because doesn't this confuse you a little bit that changing water into wine is the very first miracle Jesus performs? It's like... I kind of want him to heal an eight-year-old girl from a disease that she's dying from or maybe a, a man who has a family and he can't see his family because he's on the outskirts of town because he's got leprosy. I mean, you think of all the miracles that Jesus did do and you're going changing water into wine. I mean, do we want Jesus just to be known as keep the party going? <laughs> Right? I mean, it's like, if you want more dance moves, that's it. That's all I got. I was raised very legalistic. Couldn't dance. When I do those kinds of things, my, my little granddaughter says, Papa, please don't do that in public. She was trying to teach me some of those moves, you know. But, yeah. No wine at a wedding. We're just going to keep the party going. What could he be saying? What could he be saying about this miracle that would cause his first disciples to believe? Because we read, keep reading, and it says, and after he did this, they believed. Like, what is it about changing water into wine? So I'm praying that in addition to us just enjoying the scriptures together, and learning about Jesus and this story, that, that it might impact our faith. That maybe you're here today and you're just exploring your faith. You don't, you don't know. You're just dipping your, your toes into the water of this, the claims that Jesus made. Or, or maybe you've gone through some major disappointment, setback, and you're just going, I just don't know what I believe anymore. Or maybe you're here today and your faith is just old and cold. I think we've all been there, where our faith is just old and cold, and we need to be renewed. We need to, to have it refreshed, and so that's my prayer today. And so the, the, the idea that we're working with is this. As the master of the feast, Jesus came to take away our shame and bring us peace and joy. And I want us to look at this story in three different sections, and the first one is what I call the hour. The hour. In John chapter 2, verses 1 through 5, we see <clears throat> that Mary comes to Jesus, and you have to think about, it's like, why did she come to him? There's no mention of Joseph. Scholars say that Joseph may have died uh, in Jesus' early childhood, maybe uh, before he turned 12. And so that's why the Holy Spirit came um, at his baptism and said, the father said, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased because Jesus probably didn't have his bar mitzvah. His father, he was considered an illegitimate child. But after, after the birth and just when Jesus was two years old, there's no mention really of Joseph in his life. And so scholars believe that he may have passed early in Jesus' life. So Mary comes to Jesus. Is she coming to him because she noticed he's different? <laughs> 
that he could probably do something about this? Or did she just come to him because maybe, maybe uh, he's become the man of the house and that she would, she would come to him? This is more than just a simple embarrassment. This is, this is more than just we ran out of fried chicken. This is more than, than we ran out of, uh, you know, Coke Zero. I mean, this is, this is just, this is more than an embarrassment because in the time that Jesus, in fact, in the Middle East, in the Eastern culture, they, they operate, they behave in their life with a honor-shame culture. What do we mean by honor, shame, culture? It means that I consider everything that I do in my life, is it going to bring honor or is it going to bring shame to my family? And then when you think about the outer circle of my family, is it going to be shame? Am I going to bring shame to my my village? Am I going to bring honor to my village? We don't think that way in Western civilization. We think individualistic. I can do what I want to do when I want to do it, and I don't care. We don't, we don't, <laughs> not our house. <laughs> Good. I, I raised my boys that way too. <laughs> it's like, you're a B-Roth, and B-Roths don't do that. <laughs> and so, but in this, our Western culture, we live in an individualistic society. Me, myself, and I. But in that day, this, this, would have bring, this would bring shame to this family. In fact, when you think about the father of the bride would be looking at that groom and go, you're going to take care of my daughter and you can't even manage the wine menu? How are you going to take care of my daughter? And you would think that Jesus would say, of course, I'll help that his response would be one of compassion and jump right in, but he doesn't. In fact, when you read read his response, (laughs) yes, Lord? (laughs) When you read his response, it seems a bit abrupt or curt. Woman, why do you involve me? My hour has not yet come. And so you're thinking, well, maybe that's just English. Let's read it in the Greek. In the Greek, it's woman, woman, why are you involving me? It's just as curt, it's just as abrupt in, in the Greek. And then there's this cryptic statement, my hour has not yet come. What I believe that Jesus is doing here is that he is now, as he begins to step into his earthly ministry, he is separating himself from the will of his mother to the will of his father. And he's basically telling his mom, there's only one voice from here on out that I need to listen to. I need clarity on what the father tells me to do, not what you're telling me to do. So there's a separation between this motherly uh, son connection. They will always be connected and they will always, he will always watch out for her. Even at the cross, he asked one of his disciples to care for his mother. There's the, still that caring, but what Jesus is doing, he's stepping into the authority of what he wants, what his father wants him to do. And when he says, my hour has not yet come, it's very significant in, the, in this storyline. In John's gospel, this description, this hour, he uses this word to describe the crucifixion. When he talks about my hour has yet not come, notice in John chapter 8, John uses this again, and Jesus has made some people frustrated by some of his comments and they were going to attack him. And it says no one seized him. Why? Because his hour had not yet. It's not time for him to die. In John chapter 12, he says, now my soul is troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. No, it was for this reason I came to this hour is referring to the cross and then right before that in John chapter he says father the hour has come 
glorify your son that your son may glorify you. And so what Jesus is, is, is seeing, what he's looking at in this situation is how am I supposed to respond to my mother's request? What am I supposed to hear from my father as the cross is casting its shadow already on this event? The cross is already casting a shadow. And Jesus is going to reveal who he is in a unique way by changing the water into wine. And basically what he's saying to his mother is, you want me to remove shame and guilt? You want me to do something that will bring joy to this wedding ceremony, to this celebration? I am going to one of these days, Mom. I'm going to remove shame, and I'm going to remove guilt, and I'm going to bring the ultimate joy. But that ultimate joy, that ultimate removal of guilt and shame isn't going to happen today. My hour's not come. So what does he do? John uses the word sign. This is the first sign. A sign points to something. And so they're going to point. Jesus in this miracle is going to point to the cross. What is he going to accomplish on the cross? And so you would think that his mom would just go, right? The mom look. <laughs> she doesn't. She just walks away and tells the servant, do, do what he tells you to do, <laughs> right? I think that was kind of <laughs> do what he tells you to do. Just lis listen to him. So the second part of this story is what we want to call the water, the water. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremony, ceremonial washing, each holding 20 to 30 gallons. Now, I was going to order six antique ceremonial jars on Amazon, but we're on a budget. So I found, I found this 32-gallon uh, container out in the, the shed. It was full of uh, basketballs and footballs and stuff for the youth. And so I wanted to give you a visual. I wanted to give you a visual. Uh, when I talked about Jesus turning water into wine, there's like six of these, right? Six of these. Think about that. That will keep the party going, <laughs> right? There's six of these. And, and John says that they're for ceremonial washing, not for hygienic washing, for ceremonial washing. It's not drinking water. And so you're thinking, okay, what is that all about? What does that mean? It's not hand sanitizer. It's, it's, it's to do something that the Jewish people did every time before they ate a meal. Now, John is part of the New Testament. John is uh, writing his gospel, his, bi his biography of Jesus, his account of the story of Jesus on earth. And uh, there are four. So if you look at the New Testament, if you're new to the Bible, if you look at the New Testament, this chart will show you uh, Matthew, the Gospels, then you got history, then you got the epistles, and you got letters, and you got prophecy. Well, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they wrote for a certain audience. Mark is a very fast-moving gospel. It's a lot of Latin in its uh, language and idioms. And so scholars believe that Mark was written to a Roman audience. So they would not have been accustomed to Jewish um, rituals. So if you look at the gospel of Mark at this account, listen, listen to this. Mark is, um, would basically say something, and then he would go, okay, you're Roman, you don't understand what I'm talking about, and there would be a, parent, a, par a parenthesis. So parenthetically, he would say, so this is what, so in Mark chapter 7, the Pharisees and some of the teachers of the law who had come from Jerusalem gathered around Jesus, and they saw that his disciples were eating food with hands that were defiled and unwashed. In other words, they didn't dip their hands in the ceremonial jar and do this ritual before they ate. 
It, again, it wasn't hygienic. It wasn't Perel. It wasn't hand sanitizer. It was for this reason. And it says, and then, then so Mark goes, the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they give their hands a ceremonial washing, holding to the traditions of the elders. When they come from the marketplace, they don't eat unless they what? Wash. So, let me explain it a little bit. So, you're a Jewish person, and you go to the marketplace, and you pick up this pot. And you want to check it to see if it's got any cracks or anything in it. And you want to see, okay, who is the artiste that that made this pot? And and do I really want to get this? And you examine it, and then you put it down. And then you go home after the marketplace. You grab your food, and and you eat, right? No. You have to go to this big jar of ceremonial water and wash your hands, not to cleanse your hands from germs, but from sin. Because you don't know who touched this. Maybe a lady of the evening was at that marketplace. And she picked it up to examine it and put it back down. Or maybe a tax collector picked it up and examined it and put it down. And if you went home and did not wash your hands in the ceremonial jar, and you ate food, you ingested the sin of that person that touched that jar. That's what the Pharisees believed. And so Jesus responds to them. He replied, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites, as it is written. These people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. And he went on to say, he went on to say that it's not what comes out of a person that defiles them, for it is within Out of a person's heart, the evil thoughts come. Sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. All these evils come from the inside and defile a person. It's not what you eat that defiles you. And he was basically saying, you can wash your hands all you want, but you've got a heart problem. I have a heart problem. Don't leave me hanging. I have a heart problem, and you have a heart problem. And all the ceremony and all the ritualistic things that we can go through are not going to heal our heart. So, what is Jesus saying? He takes this ceremonial water... And he provides an opportunity to reveal his essence and his character and what he really came to do. John also wrote several other uh, letters. He wrote in 1 John, and you're, not, you're never going to guess what his other letters were. 2 and 3 John <clears throat> and Revelation. But he wrote in 1 John that I think is very, very significant at this moment in our teaching. It says, if we claim that we have no sin, we are only fooling ourselves and refusing to accept the truth. But if we confess our sin to him, he can be depended on to forgive us and to what? Cleanse us. He becomes the ceremony. He becomes the water that washes away our sin. So maybe we should just stop here for a moment and just deal with some things in our lives that maybe we find ourselves stuck in shame or guilt. Or maybe we try to do things in our own strength 
I just need to do better. And if I, if maybe if I just, you know, if I do all the things I should do, like we think of spiritual disciplines, pray, read my Bible, go to church, and all those, and, and those things we should do consistently. But, but when we think that that's what changes here, we're substituting those activities for the work of Christ in our life. And that's what the Pharisees had done. And Jesus is using this moment to declare the fact, I am going to remove guilt. I am going to remove shame. I am going to bring joy to you. So what does Jesus do with the water? Let's read. Jesus said to his servants, fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. And then he told them, now draw some of the out and take it to the master of the banquet. So they did. The master of the banquet tested the water. So here, here's what I want you to see. There was no fanfare. There was no doo -doo 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 for my next trick. There, it wasn't, there wasn't anything. It was just silently. The only people that knew were a few of his disciples and the servants. And it had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it had come from, though the servant who had drawn out the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside and said, everyone brings out the choice wine first. Then the cheaper wine, after the guests had been, had too much to drink, but they have saved the best till now. What Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. Notice what he says. It's not the first miracle. John calls it a sign. And there's seven of them in the Gospel of John. So you have, what are signs? I want you to uh, just picture a, a, a figure of a figurine of a man and a woman side by side with a line in the middle. What does that represent? Those of you who fly, you get off a plane. It's like, where's the bathrooms? You don't look for a sign that says, our water closets, our restrooms, our blah, 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 blah. You look for that, right? Because it points to something. And John is saying that this miracle of turning the water into wine pointed to something. It pointed to the essence and the character of Jesus. Like I said, John has seven of these. One day he fed 5,000 people. And the disciples were talking to him as they went across the, the water. And they forgot the bread. And he goes, I am the bread of life. So when he fed his, 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 all those 5,000 people, it was a sign to show that if you partake of me, you'll never go hungry. I'd encourage you to look those up. In fact, on the Beyond the Weekend, they're all listed there for you, these signs. For you and me, to understand the impact of Jesus turning the water into wine, we have to step into the life of the disciples for a moment. I want us to build a bridge back to their experience and then build a bridge, then walk across that same bridge and apply this to our lives. The changing of the water to wine would have set bells off in a Jewish mindset. And they would have reflected all the way back to the Old Testament. So when the prophet Isaiah was talking about the end of the world and the impact of the kingdom of God and the coming of the Messiah, this is what he says in Isaiah chapter 25, verse 6. And the disciples would have known this verse. On this mountain, the Lord Almighty will prepare a feast. What mountain? Jerusalem. In this location... The Lord Almighty will prepare a feast of the richest of food for all people. A banquet of what? Aged wine. The best of meats and what? The finest of wines. Notice what he goes on to say. And he will swallow up death forever. The sovereign Lord will wipe away every tear from all faces. And he will remove people's disgrace from all the earth. And when Jesus changed the water into wine, their mind went back to Isaiah 25 and they go, it's him. It's him. He's the master of the feast. 
He's the master of the feast. And, and when you look at this, you have to say, God gave us an image when all in the world is made right. And this is the image that he gives us, a feast. There's a picture of a wedding and the joy that takes place. And I have to think about how can we apply this to our lives. And, and when you think about the disciples, they went through a lot of anxiety as they followed Jesus. Even up to the cross, their life was full of anxiety. And then after that resurrection, man, they were on, that nothing would stop them. Why? Because they understood that he came to renew all things and that he was going to make all things right. And so when we think about even it, even in our best moments like this, we still carry anxiety to those tables. You think of Thanksgiving and you go, I just, I love Thanksgiving. But for most of it, it's drama dressing, turkey, drama pie. Yeah. <laughs> Several times. If you go, you know, to different, if you're married and you got to go to in-laws and outlaws and all these different, it's just, and, but, and, and we carry anxiety with us, Right? Not that everything is wrong all the time, but something is wrong with everything as we live in this life. And God will mend everything one of these days, and he will make everything new. No disease, no death. The Bible begins this way. In the beginning, God. And isn't it interesting that John begins his gospel, in the beginning was God. The word. And it's like John sees Jesus as the one who was at the beginning, and now he comes in his earthly ministry and he's going to renew because he is the Messiah. John is envisioning Jesus coming as one who created all things, and now he's going to renew all things. There was a pastor that I followed a lot, and I still read his stuff. I haven't read everything. Uh, even even after his death, he passed away this last year from cancer. But his name's Tim Keller, and he gave uh, five lectures for uh, non for his for for Christian uh, young adults to bring their non-believing friends. And he was teaching on this actual passage of scripture. And I want you to I want you to notice this. When Jesus said, "My hour has not come," he was referring to the cross. And this is what he said: At the wedding feast, Jesus said, "In the midst of joy, sipping the coming sorrow, so that we can sit in the midst of our sorrow and sip the coming joy." That is the message of changing water into wine. It's not just to keep the party going. <laughs> It's the fact that Jesus was looking at the cross and in the midst of that joyful moment, he wanted, some, he wanted his followers to know something. He came to renew all things. He came in his moment of death, burial, and resurrection to take our sorrow upon himself and bring us great joy. Maybe... You've been going through anxiety. Maybe you've been going through something that would trouble your soul or disrupt your physical existence. Jesus changed the water into wine so that in those moments of your life, you can look forward to a feast where the food will never run out and the wine will always be the best. I think this is what Jesus is saying, this picture. The table's prepared. The feast is on God's calendar and everyone's invited. Maybe you're here today and you're just exploring your faith, like I said, and you're just a maybe. Maybe knowing that one of those chairs has your name on it, instead of maybe, you'd say yes. You'd say yes to the invitation. There's room at the table. And that's what Jesus was saying in this first sign. 
I'm come to be the master of the feast, and I invite you to sit at my table. Let's pray. I want to give you an opportunity today that that maybe your faith has been old and cold, and, and you need Jesus to renew something. And maybe you're here today and you just said, maybe. Maybe one of these days I'll give my life to Christ. And today could be a yes. You could find yourself sitting at that table. I don't know where you are. Maybe you're just in the midst of sorrow and you've lost sight of the joy that he came to bring. And maybe as you look at that picture and you're sitting in your own sorrow, you could just be grateful that Jesus came to invite you to the feast where there will be great joy and no drama, (laughs) no anxiety, but peace and joy. As we sing this song, I just want you to take a moment and just go, wherever you are, just have a moment with the Lord right now. Just communicate with him before we leave this place. Just as I am without